But John tried to deter Jesus, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And this moment recorded in all four of our Gospels will always be what we talk about on the first Sunday after the Epiphany. So as this Epiphany season starts off, as we have moved past, you know, Christmas and baby Jesus lying in the manger and the shepherds and the angels and the wise men have gone on home, we begin the public ministry of Christ. He is now an adult. He is now a full-grown man, most likely 30 years old because that was the age you needed to be to begin a legitimate rabbinical ministry. And so the public ministry of Jesus, the, what we think about when we consider the gospel story, who Jesus is and, and what he did, the, the, the teachings and the preachings and the, the miracles and, and everything that will move towards building the kingdom of God and then in Jerusalem with his crucifixion, sacrifice, his death, his resurrection, this is really where it starts. Everything else has been kind of a, kind of a prelude, sort of a, a precursor, laying the foundation, the, 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 the time of a world that dwelt in great darkness, that longed to see this light of Christ, and it moves on to that birth with the shepherds and the angels. And depending on you know how the calendar works, we may or may not get any wise men, or we may or may not get that time where he's 12 years old, and he, uh, he kind of gets lost from the caravan and goes and starts teaching again. And, and Mary and Joseph say, oh, where are you doing? Where are you going? We tend to not always get those because when we start the gospel story anew, it's going to start here. It's going to start in the waters of the Jordan River. It is going to start with the baptism through John the Baptist, a, a baptism of repentance. Turn away, turn around from how you've been, from where you've gone. Turn back to God. And in those waters, feel the washing, feel the cleansing. Know that as something is happening on the outside of your body here in this river, that something is also happening into your soul. And you are being renewed, you are being refreshed, and you are being cleansed. And we start our Epiphany season like we start the story of Christ and his ministry. Here in the Jordan, where the one and only guy who never needed to be baptized, Baptized. Jesus has nothing to repent of. Jesus has nothing within his soul that requires this renewal, this refreshment, or this cleansing. Instead, he says, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. He does this really kind of unnecessary act, but he does it for our sakes. <clears throat> that he who is fully divine is also fully man. And out of love, he's going to take that all away. He's not going to skip over parts. He's not going to do the things of real human life that are easy or fun or good. He will also experience the things that are hard or difficult, <coughs> the times of hunger and of thirst. And to say, when I take on your real life, I mean all of it. And so we who do need to be baptized, Jesus doesn't leave that part aside. But in solidarity with us, your whole lives, all of this world, <coughs> it really means to be a man. And out of love, I will do it. And I will do it all. And I will do it for you. And so... Because this always happens every year, you know, no matter what the uh, lectionary cycle or whatever it happens to be, I have preached on the baptism of Christ a lot. You know, I've, several times, many times uh, over the years. And, and, and I think I can, I can explain some of the doctrine underneath it and make the, the, the scriptural connections about where this is all fitting together and, and, and the why and, and start connecting it to our own baptisms. And I've preached about it a lot, and I think because I believe it, and I trust in it. But then just over a year ago, 
I went into those waters. Now, I try to use my Israel trip very sparingly. I don't want this to be like, you know, kind of regular sermon travel log. But every now and again, something happens or something comes up, and I, and I feel like I almost have to. You know, I have preached about this same passage, and I believe with conviction because I believe it many, many, many times over many, many, many years. But it means something different to me now because I was in those waters too. And it's an almost indescribable feeling. It, it seems almost pointless to talk about it, but at the same time, I feel like I have to. How can I not at least try? So this happened in our tour group, sort of late within our time. We've been together for several days, and we had an opportunity then to go to Yarden. Yarden is a, it's a facility built there on the banks of the Jordan in a particular spot that the, the government of Israel sort of set up, knowing that pilgrims come from all over the world all year long, hoping and waiting and desiring to just be in those waters. Some of them to be baptized for the first time, some of them to just feel what it must have felt like to walk in the footsteps of Christ. And so, you know, we drive the tour bus into Yardinet, and it is a tacky, tacky tourist trap. Now, I'm an Orlando boy, born and bred. I know tourist traps. <laughs> My professional opinion was that this was a tourist trap. And you, like all good tourist traps, when you get in there, you're there for a reason, for a purpose. But before you can get to that reason and purpose, you first have to walk through a gift shop. That's right. So you do. You walk through this gift shop. And it's, it's, it's kitschy, and it's tacky. And this is not the first time in the Holy Land where you have been inundated with kitchen tackiness. You know, you can't hardly go to any of these sites without someone on the street hawking their wares. And, you know, they've got everything from, you know, well, this is a piece of a true cross to this cross is made of pure gold to this was probably one of Jesus' real diapers. And honestly, it's only 10 bucks. It's a deal. So you kind of see this a lot. And, and, and after a while, I think it's very natural to have a kind of way on you. You know, you are there. I was there for this holy experience. And, and, and people travel from all over the world. And people have done so for hundreds upon hundreds of years to just be in that spot. I want to see what Jesus saw. I want to stand in a place that I think he stood in or, or touch a stone that existed when he was there. And it's amazing and it's powerful, but at the same time, all the crass commercialism is also all around you. And I think it's real natural to sort of get a little discouraged. And I, we get into the gift shop and I'm starting to, my feelings are starting to ebb and flow. You know, it's, like, it's kind of a downer. Like, uh, you know, they want to sell you like souvenir spoons and things. And it just seems like it's very, sort of cheapening the whole thing, you know? And so now my attitude is starting to be not so great and I'm starting to get a little disappointed and frustrated. And it's, it's just, why take something so beautiful and holy and you're making it kind of cluttered and you're making it kind of tacky and you're just trying to score a quick buck and ah. Uh, and then you get past the gift shop. And it opens up there on the banks of the river. And there's places built to sit. And there's a convent that runs this little operation. And, and it, it runs very, very smoothly because, again, it's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people every single day. And you, you know, pay a little bit of money and you get this kind of white baptismal gown. And then you go as a group into your seating area. And then you go into the waters. And I had been a little discouraged and a little annoyed. And I went to the Jordan River. And none of it mattered anymore. None of it mattered anymore. I can't describe it, but I feel like I have to try. 
as, as messy and as frustrating and as kitschy and tacky and commercialized and whatever as everything else was. And it wasn't that it was a million miles away. It's like it didn't even exist anymore. And I was in those waters. And it wasn't what I hoped it would be. It was even deeper beyond I could have imagined. And so I made friends with people in the tour group, and they knew that I was a pastor. And, and, and several of them asked, you know, I would like to renew my, 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 my baptism. Would you, would you baptize me? Baptize people in the water. The Jordan River. Never felt anything like that before in my life. After I did it a few times, and it was done. I had to go down underneath myself just to do it. The power and the holiness, and none of that other stuff mattered because this was real and this was true. And in that moment, it was not academic. It wasn't something I had read. It wasn't something I had thought about. It wasn't something that I had preached on before. I knew it. <coughs> I was there. About 250 years ago, there was an English poet, William Cowper, who was also the son of an Anglican priest. He wrote the words to the song that we heard during our intro. A song that's often associated with baptism, so in a baptismal service. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And the first time I heard that song so many years ago and just thought, oh gosh, what a mess. <laughs> Sounds awful, right? Like, if your imagination sparks on this, you start thinking about it for a second, can you think about it? A fountain, but it's not filled with water, and that fountain is filled with blood. And that's super gross. <laughs> Have you ever recovered a blood before? Yeah? yeah? You know, it's really gross. And it's wet and it's sticky. And I mean, I'm starting to think of a fountain and there's so much of it, maybe it's going to start coagulating or something. And this is just awful. And you're going to dump people in that. And they're going to come up, it's going to be a mess and a wreck. And maybe they're starting to splash everywhere. Another blood all over the floor. And oh my God. And I couldn't get it out of my head. How just what like a, a, this awful, messy, disgusting scene. <laughs> that this must be. And I allowed the words to start to make a difference. Now, imagine if you can come up with a scene that's pretty messy and gross, but allowing the scriptural and theological truth within this poetic metaphor to start making a difference. Within the waters of baptism, we find not just water, but we find the very sacrifice of Jesus. We are washed sacramentally, that outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace as, as we go into those waters and the, 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 the dirt and the weariness and toil of our days and lives are washed away from our bodies, but, but something is happening on the inside in our souls that's making us renewed and refreshed and cleansed from the inside out. And it's like the blood of Jesus shed on the cross for the sake of the world, covering over us like, like in the Exodus story on the, on the doorpost of the homes where death would then pass over and that family would live. And within the waters of baptism, you go into the font, and it's not just water washing you, it is the blood of Christ not covering you with mess, but cleansing your soul until you're new, cleaner than any soap or detergent could possibly do. And I learned to love that hymn. 
and I still do. It's powerful and it's profound <coughs> in a theological sense and a practical sense and, and in a small way it's part of the reason why I, I love doing baptisms and, and frankly I do them that weird crazy way that I do. We bring out that big old font and big old bowl and I start splashing around, right? You've, I'm assuming everyone here, or almost everyone here, has seen me do a baptism. And I'll take a picture of water and I'll read real high, real high. The water starts splashing, and then I'll when I when I touch the waters for the blessings or say the the, the flood prayer, first written by Martin Luther, and, and I start throwing it around, and and the, and the kids start to gather in, you know, because number one, baptisms are interesting. The kids want to see it, and number two, I sort of established a a shamu splash zone. And they all want to get wet. And so I'm expecting this to get everywhere. And I've got water slopped all over the floor. And it's down my sleeve. And my, my poor prayer book. You know, it's all waterlogged still. I get that moment and baby or that adult or whatever. And, and it just seems to me that the right thing to do is to make that mess. That it's not just a little drops on the forehead. But we're, you know, whether it's the big bowl or even the, the, the little bowl over in the in the, the sacristy, I, I, the sanctuary, I, I want it to really get them wet. And I'm trying to scoop water with my father and the son, really everywhere. And, and, and then they get to they cry, and I love it. I like when they cry. Because when they cry, it's, you know it's something big happening. And uh, I've, I've never had to pinch a child, but I've thought about it. You get this one like perfect little angel with the, their little beatific faces, and the, the water goes on them on this you know, perfect little brow, and everything. And I, I just want to shake them up a little bit, like, hey, don't you know what's going on? It's a big deal. And it is a big deal. We ought to see it and understand it and know it and feel it as a big deal. And I'll talk about making this big mess, and maybe I do it because I'm just a big dumb kid at some level, and I like to make a mess, and it's true. And, and maybe I make a mess because I'll, I'll talk about how the, the tradition of the church, you look from living water, water that was moving and flowing and rushing, and it had that image and metaphor that was very, very personal and concrete about the, the power of the spirit and the, the, the renewal of life. But part of it, Part of it is this, is this mess of the fountain filled with the blood of Jesus that, that when we think about that metaphor, it, it ought to be a, a horrific mess almost because that's what life is like. Life is a mess. And baptism doesn't pretend otherwise. <laughs> baptism meets us in that mess and washes us over. Refreshes us and cleanses us and renews us. You go into those waters... You dive into that blood and the dead live. Life is a mess. You know? It's hard. When things happen that we can't control. Or they happen in ways we don't want them to. Or we, we, we prepare one way and, and, it, and it goes another. Or Things are going pretty well, and then something happens outside of our control, and it's all gone. Life is hard, and sometimes it hurts. It's a mess, and sometimes we're doing our best to just kind of keep scooping stuff off the floor. But it keeps running back through our hands. And life is a mess because we suffer. We get sick, and we're weak, we're worried and anxious about what's going to happen later today or the days to come. And life is a mess because the people we love hurt and suffer. And for my money, that's always worse. Give it to me. Give it to me. I'll take it. Please, please. Enough. I don't want them to hurt anymore. I will do it. Let them be okay. It's a mess. And yet what happens in baptism? 
So God does not deny our mess. He meets us deep in the mess. Maybe unnecessarily so. The one guy who doesn't need to be baptized, this is how his public ministry starts, by being baptized. By jumping into our mess, jumping into our lives, taking on what he doesn't need to do, but he does so out of love. And only by doing that are we ever rescued from it. So we gather for baptism, and we, before we even get to the water part, we make this covenant, we make these promises, right? The, the repent and be baptized from the book of Acts then laid out in this sort of formalized, codified manner. And we, we, can, we can look at the, the baptismal covenant that we say with each baptism, and about the first half of it, it's all kind of theological. You know, you are making promises about what you believe and who you trust. And basically, we take the Apostles' Creed and break it into pieces, and you have the chance to say, well, you believe this? Yes, I believe that. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe that. And so part of this element of the, of, of the baptismal covenant is saying on the inside, you know, this, the, the outward visible sign of the inward spiritual grace, but inside, in my, in my mind, in my heart, in my soul, this is what I know. And this is what I believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in his life within the church. I believe and trust in these things. But then it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop just on the internal. It doesn't stop just on the spiritual or mental. We then move to the application of the practical. Because the second half of the promises are stuff like, will you continue the apostle teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers? Are you going to go to church or not? And you have to say yes. We persevere resisting evil. We proclaim a good word by example and good news. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons? Will you strive for justice and peace? We get all of these other things that we say again and again, I will. I will with God's help. Yes, I will do this. Because we're acknowledging, even in our mess, that God wants every part of us, all of us, inside and out, top to bottom, our bodies and our souls. We start off with that internal commitment this is what I believe, this is who I trust, but then we say, it's got to work to the outside, so I will make these promises and commitments about my behavior, about my words, about my character and integrity, about how I'm going to live my life, how I'm going to treat other people, the sort of ways I'm going to order my week. And then and only then, do we start getting into water. Within our messy lives, we pledge and we promise back to God and hope and praise our outsides and our insides, our bodies and our souls. And that outward invisible sign of the inward spiritual grace, we go into those waters and the, you know, you're kind of washed, you're sort of cleansed, and we feel it. But then on the inside, renewed and refreshed, redeemed by water and by blood. Maybe I make a mess because I just don't know a better way to convey what I think is happening and just how important it is. I don't know, maybe a few drops or a little pour don't make that much of a difference, but to me, so significant, so powerful, so profound, how can it not just spill out into everyone and into everything that if we trust what this means, then yes, that fountain is filled with water, but it is also filled with the very blood of Christ. And through his life, death, and resurrection, we can go in there, in that mess, be made clean, and we can live. <coughs> so that same hymn starts off so messy. It ends like this. When this poor, lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to sing. At the end of our lives, when the mortal part of us is now done 
and complete. The end of the song at the end of our lives. It will be in praise. Because within our mess, the blood of Christ has come through our baptism and the dead will live.